guys in Secret Lands is here. You're listening with a good friend, veteran of these podcasts. Only on the Count It Out 7 YouTube channel. Jay, let's go! Hello again, everybody, and welcome to the Good Friends, Better Enemies podcast. My name is Jay, and I'm joined, as always, by the ever-present and joyful Tyrone. Tyrone, how are you doing today, pal? I'm ready to get extreme today, buddy. How are you? I am good. I just opened myself a cold tall boy, and I'm ready to get into this sucker. It's going to be interesting to uh, see how you think of my ECW rebooking. Uh, this, of course, was... Um, sort of at the apex of ECW. I feel like 97, they're at their sweet spot. For those of you that aren't aware, this week we are covering the ECW Barely Legal pay-per-view from 1997. In fact, it's ECW's first ever pay-per-view. It's pretty exciting stuff. And uh, Tyrone, this was your choice for me. Uh, What made you come to this conclusion? Well, we've been pretty fed heavy. Uh, thrown in a bit of WCW, and we've really only done the one. Have we we've done one ECW show, correct? My oh, I think we did ECW December to Dismember, which that doesn't count. That doesn't count, and judging by our viewership for that episode, it definitely doesn't count. So, so uh, I thought we we should if we're going to start with ECW, why not start with the very first one? And I know you haven't been the biggest ECW fan in your life. You can, re- you can definitely appreciate it. I know that. But I know it's not your cup of tea all the time. So I thought, why not? We just had to watch a whole bunch of WrestleMania. Let's go with the ECW right now. Yeah, that's very fair. Uh, I-, I was okay with it. I, I watched it uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact. And uh, rebooked it. I uh, had an interesting... Um, look at things and a take on things. Uh, The one thing I kind of noticed that was going into this particular event before we get into our other piece of business, I just want to kind of add into, add into um, our discussion here is that I didn't find that there was a lot of storyline going into it. Uh, They didn't really have a lot of video packages and things of that nature uh, to, to sort of catch you up as to what was going on. So um, I took my best shot at it. I did some research in and around the event to see what was going on in the promotion But um, before we get into that, I think we have something else to discuss. We're a little bit late on the trigger here. uh, We're a little bit late in discussing this on the podcast. But um, typically, we do our This Week in Wrestling History, and we kind of took a hiatus from that based on WrestleMania. We did some fun trivia stuff and talked about the events of Mania. And we were going to get back into our normal format as of uh, this week's episode. But something kind of big happened. And it's something that I think a lot of people kind of tend to forget every year that WWE does their house cleaning this time of year. And we've had some uh, releases this past week. Um, What are your thoughts about the releases? And uh, were you surprised uh, about the names that were released? Because, as I said, a lot of times I I feel like it catches me by surprise. I know it's coming, but then I kind of forget. And then suddenly I see on social media uh, the old future endeavors. So what are your thoughts? I mean, a couple of them definitely caught me off guard. I was definitely surprised with Samoa Joe, Billy Kay, and Peyton Royce. Those were the three that caught me off guard. The other ones, not so much. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I didn't even really remember that Tucker was still with the company. I know that's horrible to say. That one didn't shock me. Kalisto didn't shock me. Bo Dallas kind of did because I thought that they would insert him into the Fiend gimmick somehow, but... Overall, no, wasn't really shocked by a lot of them. It did kind of weird me out that it was done exactly one year to the day when they furlonged everybody last year due to COVID. So I guess I guess it's just a, a yearly tradition on that day of the year now. Yeah, well, you don't you you have to remember as well that uh, the quarterly financials are going to be coming out this week for WWE. So I, th- I can't imagine that probably plays a big part of it as well that they want to have. Uh, unloaded some of that um, I guess I hate to use this term but you know sort of trimming the fat on their on their expenses vis-a-vis talent so I guess they wanted to show a a stronger number going into the next quarter and things of that nature so I'm not surprised by it Uh, they've been doing it every year for the last several years I, I think the last at least 10 years they've been doing these cuts at the the tail end of uh of April or mid April I'm with you. I feel like Samoa Joe was a bit of a surprise. 
Uh, they took him off the commentary team. I think that his sort of bone of contention was that he wanted to be in ring and competing. And apparently he hasn't been cleared. I don't know the specifics exactly. But I will say that I have a bit of a different take on, on this whole thing. And that is that there's one name that's not really discussed a whole lot that I feel like is a big time get for a company like AEW. Now, I, I don't want AEW to start signing everybody. I think that'd be a mistake to start signing all the release talent from WWE. But I definitely think the name that they should pick up is Mickey James. Their women's division is, they have a lot of talent on their roster, AEW does, in the women's division. But I definitely feel as though somebody like a Mickey James could help anchor that talent and ha- help anchor that division and really help it grow and prosper uh, into a more of a competitive environment uh, with the WWE women's division, help be one of those building blocks to help them um, sort of reach a different level of, of, of uh, prosperity. So I-, I think that Mickey James is a name that really hasn't been touched on a whole lot. And I definitely think that she is the name to get for AEW. See, I, I agree that Mickey James definitely will do whatever company picks her up wonders. But think of it like this. Can you picture Mickey James going to the NWA, being the spearhead of the NWA women's division? Her husband, Nick Aldis, is already their champion. You have a built-in storyline there. Power couple running through everybody till you get that young upstart couple or talent or whatever they're going to do that knocks them off the throne. That's personally where I would love to see Mickey James go. But if you want somebody for the AEW women's division, then I say Chelsea Green. You bring back the hot mess Laurel Laurel Van Ness character, put it in AEW, that's going to be fucking fantastic if you ask me. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. I think it's a good idea to have her go there as well. I mean, let's face it, talents such as those that we just mentioned are going to be successful wherever they go. Um, I think my point was just more along the lines of the AEW women's division is it's an upstart division, much like the rest of the company. But I feel like it hasn't been quite as um, cohesive as it could be, say, if you had an anchor sort of le- uh, legacy talent like like a Nikki James in there to help guide and shape and mold the division. She's been through the trenches in WWE back when it was still bra and panty matches and things of that nature and seeing the evolution and help usher in that new, that new era for women's wrestling in the WWE. So I can't think of a better free agent to be signed by AEW right now. Uh, as for the NWA thing, I, I like that idea of her being with her, you know, shoot real legitimate husband, uh, Nick Aldis. The only thing I think is that um, this power couple angle might be a little bit overplayed right now in the industry we see a lot of power couple angles going on throughout different promotions nxt wwe aew so i kind of feel like maybe you need to separate yourself a bit you don't need to necessarily have that power couple dynamic in in the nwa right now i want to just do this quickly with you i want to name off each person that was released and you tell me whether or not you see them going to another promotion, retiring, or becoming a trainer, or what you see, okay? So we'll start off with Samoa Joe. Oh, do you want me to do you want me to name the promotion, or just if I see them going to a different promotion? No, no, no. name the promotion you think would fit them best. So Samoa Joe. I go Samoa Joe is three for me. I'd say ROH, New Japan, or AEW. Uh, I'd say two out of the three. I don't see him so much in AEW. I see him going the Ring of Honor and New Japan route, personally. Um, Billy Kay, Peyton Royce, do you see them going somewhere together or separate? Uh, I think they're going to be together. I think they're a package deal right now. Not to say that they couldn't you know, work singles as well. That was evidenced by how over Billy Kay was getting in the WWE. That's a real head-scratcher for me as well. I don't. She got herself over and then they released her. I didn't really understand that, but um yeah short answer i think they're together as a package deal and i wouldn't be so surprised to see them show up in impact actually i was gonna say the exact same thing uh mickey james we already touched on chelsea green i say she's perfect for aew i don't know about you uh i'd say aew or maybe roh the other thing too we didn't touch on as well is that um I, Outside of these uh, releases, we were talking about power couples that Mike Bennett and Maria Canellis just got signed by ROH as well. So there's another power couple dynamic that's going to be an ROH. 
Well, and you could also Matt Cardona's in um, in Impact, and he's engaged to Chelsea Green, so that could end up there too. That's true. We could do a, uh, a mixed match classic with every promotion. I kind of wouldn't hate that because it would actually be done properly. Uh, Tucker, Tucker, I see going to NWA. Um, yeah, I could see NWA or again maybe an Impact. I don't really see. Well, then again, you know, he is a, if I'm not mistaken, he's a, an NCAA wrestling, you know, star. Like he had, he had had some success as an amateur wrestler. So maybe in ROH, he would uh, do some good. I, or even, I don't know. I, I could see him teaming with a Colt Cabana or something might be fun. Yeah, that that's actually a good call. I don't mind that. Uh, Kalisto. Um, maybe CMLL. Or yeah, I'm think I'm thinking New Japan or AAA. Yeah, I definitely see him going overseas. I think that he would be a better fit somewhere around there. Well, then again, though, I could see him maybe kind of fitting into a Lucha Express type deal. So I don't know. Uh, he might be a pickup by by AEW. Uh, Wesley Blake. I have to be honest with you, and no disrespect to Wesley Blake, but I'm not even a hundred percent sure who he is. Um, I'm not overly familiar with, with him, so I, I do apologize for my naivete, but uh, I'm not quite sure who he, he is. Okay, do you remember Team Bamp from NXT, where it was him, Buddy Murphy, and Alexa Bliss? I do not. Okay, well, he was there. He was also in the Forgotten Sons, which, funnily enough, with your forgetting him, kind of proves that. And yep. most recently, he was uh, one of the knights or whatever for King Corbin before he was pulled off TV. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, uh... Any, anyways, Steve Cutler, who was also with him in the Forgotten Sons, was released a few months ago. I could see the two of them popping up in an Impact or an NWA as a tag team. Yeah. The other thing we're, we're not really touching on either is that MLW just got a contract with Vice TV. So they're going to be doing television with Vice as well. So that's another company that could emerge uh, to getting a little bit of a higher profile in the next year or 18 months. Um, so there's a lot of options, definitely. And that's, that's a great thing that's happening that's right now in the industry. There's more options now than, say, this had happened, you know, even pre-COVID. I feel like there's more options now with the pandemic in some ways than there were before. Yeah, no, that's, it's, you're weirdly right on that. Uh, just two more names I want to get through, and then we'll get back to our regularly scheduled programming. Uh, Bo Dallas. Bo Dallas is a tough one. Um, I Yeah, maybe Impact. I, I don't – see, this is the thing that uh, there's I, so many people that I have think come he out might wa- Go ahead. I think he might want to retire. I, I know he's – He's a happy man on his farm doing everything with his family. So I could see him just throwing in the towel and just living a regular life. Well, it's all about, you know, we, we all know how we feel about Hulk Hogan, but uh, his phrase really holds up. It's all about the money and the miles, right? So, you know, if he's, if he's done right for himself and his family and, and he's very comfortable and content, then I say all the power to you. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, he has nothing left to prove in the industry. I mean, he had, he had a lot of success in early on. Um, could he have gone farther? Uh, absolutely. I mean, he's one of those talents that had the ability to to transcend. I thought that original Bo Leave gimmick was quite good, and it's a shame that they took it off of him. Um, had they kept on it and sort of pushed him a little bit more frequently, I think maybe we would be talking in a different breath about Bo Dallas. But uh, unfortunately, this is this is where we're at with him. So maybe even just a little break or a hiatus and, and he comes back. The other thing we haven't talked about is, you know, some, sometimes these releases have a, a positive impact on people in the sense that they end up upping their game and coming back even stronger. Like a Drew McIntyre, for example, he was released when he was part of 3MB and look at him now. So um, maybe this is for some talents. I'm, I'm not saying all, but some talents, this is the, the kick in the kick in the backside that they need to motivate them to, up their game that's a possibility too uh, i think bo dallas was unfortunately one of many who were called up from nxt and then they just floundered on the main roster for whatever reason it may be but it, it's happened with so many talented superstars that we can't even get into that the the last person on this release list that i want to see where you're going mojo raleigh 
Um, I think probably he'll end up in AEW. I think he's going to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers with Gronk personally. <laughs> oh, you did? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. You know, you brought up an interesting point about NXT, though. You know, I, I think about these these guys that have been released, these men and women, rather, that have been released. And I wonder if there was a conversation, you know, behind closed doors when these names were selected to be released. If anybody was discussed as to, hey, you know, we brought this guy up from NXT. He's homegrown talent, this man or this woman, rather. Uh why don't we put them back down there and let them retool? I mean, somebody like a Bo Dallas returning to NXT, uh, I understand that the NXT environment, even in the last five years, has changed tremendously from what it was in its infancy when Bo Dallas was the champion and things of that nature. But to send them back down there and to retool, re-gimmick, you know, change their look, maybe learn a new hold, as they like to say, and bring them back at a later time is a viable option. And I'm not quite sure why some of these people were just let go from the company altogether. Uh, you'd think that some of these talents would be valuable assets to hold on to, especially from the time and, and money that's been invested in, in their growth and development. You'd think that maybe some of them would stay on and just have an opportunity to, um, to just sort of re retool. So I, I don't really know what the answer to that is. I mean, it worked for, I guess to a degree for Finn Balor, he was always over, but you put him back in NXT, he does the Prince gimmick again, He's he's been killing it down there. Ember Moon, now uh, Women's Tag Team Champion, Breezango, who were literally doing nothing on the main roster, ended up becoming NXT Tag Team Champion. So it it works, it's been proven. Yeah, no, absolutely it does. I think it depends on the talent. And the other thing too is that we're not really, you know, we're not in the heads of any of these these athletes, so we don't know where they are it might be that by the time they are getting their release they were ready for it they were just they, they'd kind of had enough they were fed up they wanted a break they were burnt out there's all sorts of different scenarios that you could you know call into play here in terms of where people were mentally as well which is you know really i'd say 80 percent of it you know physically if you're if you're good and at a high level if you're not injury prone or you're not you know recovering from injury that's one thing but if you're if you're mentally not invested or game in, into what you're doing or or if you're just kind of burnt out from the whole process and let's face it we've all heard that WWE internally is a very very difficult company to navigate um it could be that some of these people were just ready to to just take off and say well thanks so much and we'll see you around yeah totally i mean i've seen some of the tweets before uh, like even Tucker just wrote, I'm free, freedom. So, yeah, I'm sure that there were some people that wanted out 100%. I'm also sure that this blindsided quite a few of them. But that's that's what happens when you get let go from your job. You're not always expecting it. It's happened to me in the past. It might happen to me in the future. You never know. You're never going to expect it, unfortunately. Yeah, and that's, that's fair. I think that being... Sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to jump on into the event, but if you got anything else to say on this, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I, I agree with what you're saying. I think it's a little bit of a different scenario in, in this particular case. Obviously, with COVID, anybody working in, a, in any given job at any given time could be you know, looking at being furloughed or, or, or let go because of the nature of, of, this, uh, of this horrible pandemic that we're in, and we don't know what's around the corner but with these superstars in particular, I don't know that any of them necessarily did anything wrong. It was just, you know, I, I hearken back because we're talking about ECW today. I don't know if you remember, but back in 2005, when the Dudley Boys were released and they were, you know, one of the most decorated, if not the most decorated tag team in the history of wrestling and creative services just said, we got nothing for you. We have nothing for you. You know, we've done all we can with you. And they were released. And that was a huge thing back in then. I mean, that was 16 years ago now. But that just goes to show you that you could be one of the most established teams, established names and brands in the industry. And then in the WWE's case, you know, a lot of us were scratching our heads. How do you have nothing for the Dudleys? But, you know, sometimes things run their course, unfortunately. Uh, but them getting released was great to a degree because it gave us Bully Ray, which he turned into one of the top heroes. It was fantastic. 
Mm-hmm. 100%. I'm not, I'll never argue that point. All right. Well, I think that wraps up that conversation, and it's time for us to get extreme, folks. As Jay said at the beginning of the show, we are talking about ECW Barely Legal 1997, the pay-per-view that almost didn't happen. It happened April 13th, 97, ECW Arena in Philly with a record-breaking 1,200 fans there. Now, Jay, I say that this was the pay-per-view that almost didn't happen because in November of 1996, one of the most infamous incidents in pro wrestling happened, and that's the mass transit incident. I I feel like you know what this is, but I'm going to just kind of speak about it briefly for people listening. There was a young man uh, by the name of Eric Kuhos, I believe his name was, and he essentially lied and said that he was a trained professional wrestler. He lied about his age, uh, convinced Pauly to throw him on a show because they were short people. So they put him in the ring with, of all people, New Jack. New Jack agreed to work with this kid. He then proceeded to beat the living shit out of him and cut him so deep that it wasn't like a blade job. It was essentially attempted murder, it looked like. Uh, There was a whole bunch of trials. There was a criminal trial. There was a civil trial that... Ended up with uh, with Jack getting off of both. He did not suffer any charges because it came out that Eric had lied about his age and lied about his training. So therefore, New Jack was found not in the fault, which blows my mind. Jay, have you ever seen footage of this event? I have indeed. Um, I just want to go on record to say that uh, you know that I'm not typically somebody who gets fired up or says you know tremendously negative things on this podcast. I will go on record to say that I have zero respect whatsoever for New Jack as a human being. And I, I think that he has taken liberties with multitudes of people. I think that his moral compass is perpetually broken. And I, this might sound like a horrible thing to say, but I have a very difficult time watching any of his, his in-ring action, knowing the kind of quality of person that he is. Hey, I, I'm not going to disagree with you in any of that i'm not gonna lie though one funny little thing about new jack that i always think about when i hear his name is uh his acting audition in beyond the mat when they say he could be the next denzel no or sorry not denzel but denzel's friend yeah you could be denzel's friend yeah i i, I think he has great quality i really do that's probably because he has justifiable homicides and you're terrified of him that's probably because he was in California in the uh, entertainment business. And we all know that uh, it's like uh, the amount of smoke that they blow in, uh, in California telling you how great you're going to be in the next big thing is akin to um, the, uh, the coal room in the Titanic. That's, that is one way to put it. Jesus. Um, but I call this the, the pay-per-view that almost didn't happen, though, too, because Wade Keller... He was a professional wrestling reporter, I guess is what we would call him, leaked the information about this to Request TV, which is a pay-per-view provider in the States, and they didn't really want to do any business with ECW due to this. But I guess Pauly, at his own, like he, he will fully admit that he did this, begged and pleaded them on his hands and knees to let this show happen. When they finally gave in, we ended up with this wonderful ecw barely legal 1997 pay-per-view are you ready to get right into it Dan? yeah i was just going to make a quick point about that um because i do know the history of how this pay-per-view got you know put together and and i appreciate you running through it uh i figured you would have something to say uh, along those lines but i did notice that when you watch this pay-per-view in terms of ecw uh and its lineage and its its style and presentation it's actually one of the more subdued presentations. You don't see a ton of the hardcore, over-the-top, just, you know, crucifixion, Kane Dewey type stuff that we would see on ECW television beforehand and then on pay-per-views afterwards. Uh, this was a little bit of a, you know, let's dip our toe into this and see, you know, let's not push our button, or like, sorry, push our push the buttons too much. Let's see if we can just kind of get ourselves in here, and then from there we can show them what we're all about as opposed to, you know, being full-blown ECW right off the hop. I don't know if you noticed that, but 
my interpretation of ECW, it certainly was not watered down, but it was a more, if it was a wing flavor, it was mild, not hot. I, I think it was a combination of them trying to cover their own ass for that reason, but also because it's their first time on pay-per-view, they want to showcase that they are actually a wrestling company and do have some talent that they wanted to get noticed. Yeah, and, I, and for that reason, I appreciated this ECW presentation more than I do most. Uh, I'll always have a lot of respect for ECW uh, for what they, what they contributed to the business and, and for, for what they what they offered at the time. They certainly have their place in history. It's not my cup of tea, but uh, let's get into this. I, I'm kind of psyched to see what you think. Uh, one last thing before we get started, I just do want to preface the point that in doing my research for this episode and in watching the episode during the and doing the rebooking, uh, I did make sure that I had my timelines correct in terms of which talents were in and out in which times. So you're going to see some names that weren't on this pay-per-view that were in fact in ECW in the year 1997 in and around April. So just a little, um, I guess, um, not spoiler alert, but uh, disclaimer. Is that a bit of a jab at me for when I put Bam Bam Bigelow on an episode when he was signed to a different company? <laughs> Certainly not. Never even entered my, my thinking, my friend. All right, well, let's get into this. The show opens in classic ECW manner with Joey Styles in the ring, about to run down the match card, talking to the fans. But who comes out? None other than those damn Dudleys. And we kind of get right into the first match. Dudley boys are accompanied by Sign Guy Dudley and Joel Gertner, and they're defending the ECW Tag Team Championship against the Eliminators, John Cronus and Perry Saturn. Now, Jay, I know you are a big Saturn fan, so I feel like not much is changing on this one. First thing I want to say is uh, I have respect for Joey Styles. I have respect for the fact that he carried the broadcast for the most part uh, through, you know, by himself as a solo, solo commentator. Uh, and I think he's actually a rather very talented commentator, but I just cannot stand that high-pitched oh my god and it was within i think two minutes of this match and i just was like it was like nails down a chalkboard for me i know a lot of people love it i know it's an ecw staple but that particular style of his of his commentary i just oh i just can't get behind it okay okay so you have an issue with high-pitched jerry's or joey styles but high-pitched jerry lawler screaming puppies or any other stupid shit that would come out of Lawler's mouth you were totally fine with, correct? One, 110 percent Oh, God, here we go. All right, just rebook <laughs> the fucking match. All right, so in this particular contest, we have the ECW Tag Team Champions, the Dudley Boys, defending against the Rock and Roll Express. What the ass? <laughs> okay, nope, go. Uh, I'll hear you out. Go for it. Okay, well, it's just a classic heavyweight versus light heavyweight tag team match with the rock and roll bumping all over the place for the Dudleys. Uh, it's, you know, it goes about seven, seven to ten minutes. It's, it's a lot of fast-paced action with the rock and roll. We have the finish coming with Gibson being backdropped over the top and then Morton uh, turning into a slingshot flapjack into a 3D for the win, and the Dudleys retain. Okay, well, at least you didn't give the rock and roll the ECW tag team titles because I feel like... Having one middle-aged and crazy person on this damn show was enough. I, I didn't. I don't like this. I, I thought that this match was great with the Eliminators. It was a little convoluted, especially the finish where in the original one the Eliminators win, but then Gertner says that due to points the Dudleys are still the champs. So it was kind of confusing there. But yeah, I, you're zero for one for me right now. But I don't. I don't like this, and I feel like this is going to be a trend tonight. That's 100% fine. I, I'm okay with you not liking it. And listen, you're, you're right. I am a huge Saturn fan. Um, and I had high hopes for this match um, when we got in the ring. Excuse me. I want you to go back and watch this match. I, want you, I don't know if you watched it recently in prepping for this, this event or not. I, wa I, wa morning. I watched this this morning. Yeah. And thoroughly enjoyed it. This match for me was so slow and plodding. It was a spot fest. 
there was no psychology in this match whatsoever for me. And I also felt as though um, they, there was a lot of moments where we were waiting for spots. Even if you look at the finish of this match, it was poorly timed. Um, you know, all four guys in the ring could work, but I just felt like this match, mm, it was, it was, it, uh, it was sloppy. I found a very, it'd be a very sloppy match. Okay. Well, you done with that one? You want to move on to the next one? Sure. Okay. Well, up next, we were originally scheduled to have Rob Van Dam taking on Chris Candido. But Candido was injured. He cut a promo. So we end up with Rob Van Dam versus Lance Storm, who I had to make a note of this, was rocking the greatest bleach blonde rat tail in the history of pro wrestling. I noticed this as well, and I almost had a half a half a thought to just being like, this match, uh, the presentation, it has to change. He has to have a haircut, but you know, we'll just we'll let him keep the rat tail. Why not? Uh, I was about ten years too late with the rat tail. I feel like, but uh, all all is good. Um, this match, hey man, with, pro, with pro wrestling, with pro wrestling, everything is ten years too late. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah, certainly, certainly, you can an argument can be made. Uh, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave this match the same. It was a really really good match. You're not going to get a bad match out of RVD and Lance Storm. I'm going to keep the finish the same. Uh, yeah, it was a really, really solid match. I really appreciated seeing this. Uh, noticed that there was some fun chants directed at RVD, I guess, because he had been on Raw quite a bit at this time, you know, with Jerry Lawler and with that whole ECW versus WWF invasion deal. But, um, no, I, I really enjoyed the match. I thought it was really well worked. It was really snug. It was the antithesis of what we'd seen in the match previous. I thought that the spots were really tight and crisp and clean. Obviously, I don't think that you can necessarily equate the four workers in the previous match to these two guys in terms of work rate. But um, I just thought that this was a really, really solid presentation. Oh, you're not going to get any arguments out of me. I mean, I have openly stated that I think Lance Storm is one of the most underrated wrestlers ever. And Rob Van Dam is just Rob Van Dam. You put, them, you put these two in the ring right now in 2021, they'd probably still have the match of the night. Yeah, I, I don't doubt that at all. Well, up, ne- up next we have a fun little one that I, I totally forgot was on the show. We have a six-man, uh, I don't know if it's interpromotional or what they were calling it, but you get the great Sasuke, Gran Hamada, and Masato Yakushiji. Wow, Yakushiji, sorry, easy for me to say. Taking on the Blue World Order Japan, a.k.a. Takamichinoku, Dick To Go, and Terry Boy, a.k.a. Men's Teo, a.k.a. Kai and Tai. What do you have here, bro? Uh, this is another match that's going to stay exactly the same. Uh, Sans one thing. Uh, the Great Sasuke, Grand Hamada, and uh, Yakushiji, Yakushiji uh, are actually, or rather, I apologize, um, Takamichi Noku Terry Boy and Dick To Go are not going to be the B, uh, BWO. Uh, that BWO gimmick is gone from this card. I don't want anything to do with it. I thought it was stupid then. I think it's stupid now. I know I'm getting a lot of heat for that because ECW fans and marks love the BWO. I can't stand it, so it's gone. And we're just going to have a really solid Japanese match. But, but there's no Blue World Order, so what, what's even the point? Oh, it's an expose. You're going to see this match. You're, you're, you're bringing a lot of talent from Japan over to showcase their skills. It's not dissimilar from what the WWF did uh, in the summer of 1997 before they started doing the light heavyweight championship tournament, which Takamichi Noku won, by the way. But um, you're going to have these. Uh, actually, at the, uh, at the In Your House uh, Canadian Stampede, Takamichi Noku faced the great Sasuke uh, on that card. So uh, this was a time when they were, I think, WCW had the the upper hand on the cruiserweight division and the cruiserweight stars of the world. And you're going to see the ECW promotion as well as the WWF try to make a pitch to get into that game. And I think that this match was really, really good. It was such a great um, departure from what we had seen in other uh, you know, ECW presentations before. I think that this was a great way to showcase what ECW is all about in their first pay-per-view offering, having like that, that club sandwich of a, of a card, right? You have all these different layers. And we talked uh, recently 
in our rebooking about ebbs and flows of a card, I think that this is a great way to um, bring the audience up and down. And, and this would definitely be a highlight on the card, I think, for me. Oh, I thought the match was fantastic. It was, it was showcasing international talent, like you said. The one thing I do want to say, though, is yes, WCW had a fantastic cruiserweight division. A lot of those cruiserweights came through ECW before they went there. Just like, as you said, with Taka Michinoku and Great Sasuke going to WWF, as well, we know the rest of Kayentai did too, had to stop in ECW. It makes me question whether or not they were actually scouting these guys from Japan and Mexico, or they were just kind of waiting for Paul Lee to bring in the next super crazy, well, I guess super crazy didn't really go anywhere until after, but you get the point, like a, a crazy luchador experience or a Japanese wrestler that maybe nobody in North America had heard of, is that what put them on the radar, or were they actually watching them when they were overseas? No, I, I, that's 100% true. I, I couldn't argue with that even if I wanted to. You're, you, you are 100% on the money with that, that um, some of the more established overstars in the WCW Cruiserweight division at this time had come through ECW. I mean, you look at, you know, Guerrero, Malenko, Jericho, they were all there beforehand. They had all had their stops along the way. So I'm 100% on board with that. And I will never take away from ECW and their ability to uh, get young stars of that caliber, their break. ECW was in many ways the catalyst for breaking out some of the biggest stars in the uh, in the late 90s, you know, the, the Monday Night War era, I, I shudder to call it the Attitude Era because that's what the WWE narrative is now. But it really was the Monday Night Wars. And uh, and it's sort of the same thing. So it's sort of a funny juxtaposition with ECW where you would have superstars and talents that you would have to um, camouflage and sort of accentuate their positives in one sense. And on the other sense, you have these talents who are just completely... Um, just enriched with in-ring talent that that just needed a platform and an outlet to be able to to, to sort of give the world and expose the world to to what their uh, what their abilities were. Now you do realize that the first time that we hang out after pandemic times or whenever we're able to, I'm bringing some BWO shirts for the two of us, and that's what we're rocking the entire time. Not even a comment. Jay doesn't even want to justify that one with an answer. What a what a piece of shit. I offer the man a gift. Got, he doesn't I, even I say nothing. thank you. <laughs> exactly. I I, I'll, uh, All right. Well, I'll just I'll just talk about how they're the same. You know, this is a Finnish Finnish flag colors because I'm I'm Finnish Canadian. So. All right. Well, that there you go. As long as there's there's a reason behind it, I suppose. Let's move on. We have the ECW Television Championship up next with the franchise Shane Douglas, accompanied by. The Queen of Extreme, Francine, defeating Pitbull number two. Now, this one had some storyline behind it, and I hope that it kind of stays the same. Well, why don't you walk us through the storyline, and then from there I can tell you where we're at. So, in a previous uh, event, Shane Douglas broke Pitbull number one, Gary Wolf, legitimately broke his neck. And that's that's pretty much the storyline right now, is... Pitbull number two is coming out for revenge, trying to take out Shane Douglas. And in this match, if it still happens in the original match, you see Shane Douglas actually trying to break Pitbull number two's neck. Not for a shoot, for the match, but that, that's what this is. It's one partner avenging his other partner. Yeah, this match has changed. Um, I was aware sagely of the angle and and what had happened uh, but i decided to shelve this for now i thought for an ecw pay-per-view offering the first one i thought that having one half of a tag team avenge against shane douglas i don't know i thought that we could do a little bit better so what i've done here is i've had shane douglas going up against a mystery opponent and the mystery opponent ends up to be the beast from the east bam bam bigelow uh, he comes out to a huge face pop and dominates most of the match. There's a false finish that occurs when Francine hands brass knuckles to Douglas for a knockout punch. After a near, near fall, Douglas attempts to second knockout punch, but is blocked and is hit with the greetings of Asbury Park for the pin. And we have a new ECW World Television Champion in Bam Bam Bigelow. 
I I don't hate this at all. I I thoroughly enjoy this. You know, I'm a Bam Bam guy. I love me some Bammer. I. I have not given Shane Douglas enough love, I feel like, in in his career. Like, I always forget how good he was. Because when you think Shane Douglas, you you either think his the end of his career type thing in WCW, where he was just kind of a loudmouth shithead and not very good in the ring towards that point. Or you think of his early career as, like, the white meat babyface in the WWF. Or Dean Douglas, which are all just not great moments. I forget how much ECW Shane Douglas just kicked ass and was amazing. Could cut fucking promos to make you hate him. And could back it up in the ring. Yeah, I'm not going to disagree with that. I am a fan of Shane Douglas quite a bit. In fact, I mean, he was the first ECW champion, was he not? Uh, the first extreme wrestling champion, yes. Not the first ECW champion. Yeah, the, not the first Eastern Championship wrestling champion. No, I. But I just think that um, he's he's absolutely underrated. I mean, he was saddled with some bad gimmicks. I thought that his work in WCW towards the latter half of his uh, career that was the most prominent was quite good. I, I enjoyed his work. I think that he was injured for, for a period of it which hampered him. I mean, I think that a lot of us, maybe those of us that are aware of what was going on, like in wrestling, you know, behind the scenes and things of that nature, were probably clamoring to see that Ric Flair, Shane Douglas match that never really materialized. So that would have been cool to see. Uh, I don't know why he was never brought into the fed after WCW closed. I'm sure there's reasons why I don't, I don't care to speculate because I don't know for sure. But I definitely think that had he been brought in in 2001, 2002, he would have been able to contribute at a fairly high level. Uh, at least, you know, mid, mid to upper card, intercontinental title picture or something like that. Uh, he certainly had the mic skills to be, you know, involved with the, with, the, uh, with the Attitude Era at that time. So it's unfortunate that he didn't really do too much afterwards. I mean, he was around, but not on a big grand scale or stage. Um, but to your point, yeah, I think that he deserves a lot more credit than he gets. And he was an integral part of ECW. So I just thought that this match, again, for the, for the purposes of doing your first ECW pay-per-view, um, you can save that grudge match with the pit bulls until later on, if you, if you want to do it. But I feel like for this particular match, you need a little bit more the mystery opponent thing was kind of fun. And I thought that having Bammer come in and, and win the title, in a, and not in a squash, but, you know, it was competitive, but it wasn't too long. And then, you know, he Bammer came in in June of, I think, 97. So it was, or May maybe. So it wasn't that long removed from him being there anyway. So I thought, why the hell not? Yeah, no, you're not going to get any complaints from me. I love Bam Bam. Love him winning the title. Love him beating Shane for it. Because I feel like Shane playing the heel, chasing him for the belt after, there'd be fantastic promos leading up to it. I... I thoroughly enjoy this one. Okay, perfect. Glad well, to hear up it. Next, up, next, up next, we have one of the matches that everybody was ordering this pay-per-view for. You've got Taz with Fonzie taking on Sabu. What, what, what do you got here, man? Like, this is one of those iconic matches that everybody thinks of when they think ECW. Well, that match, um, or a version of it, uh, is coming down, but I actually inserted a different match here, and I think you're going to probably hate this, but I'm going to do it anyways. Uh, I have Dr. Death Steve Williams going up against Mikey Whipwreck. I, I'll, I'll hear you out. You tell me what you got, like what's going on, why this exists, and then maybe I'll, I'll see how I feel. Well, Dr. Death was around. Uh, he had come into ECW in uh, late 96, early 97. He had been around. He had, he had been uh, utilized quite well by ECW. And I've actually treated this match like a squash. This is, this is Whipwreck getting a flurry of offense from the start, and then Williams takes over. It's booked very much like a Brock Lesnar match of today. Dr. Will, Dr. Death hits the Oklahoma Stampede for the win. Um, I didn't. I, I really thought that Doctor Death had some more legs in the industry. He was such an established guy in the UWF and uh, going on into WCW in the early '90s and late '80s. I thought that he still had some gas in the tank. He was treated 
fairly poorly by the WWF in 99 when he was with Jim Ross. I definitely think, and of course with the, uh, with the brawl for all as well in 98. So I definitely feel like Dr. Death at this time still had some gas in the tank and had he been booked correctly could have been, you know, a really monster heel for whomever the champion was at the time, you know, going forward. I don't like the fact that Dr. Death is on this card. I don't like the fact that he is squashing Mikey Whipwreck. Mikey was always kind of the whipping boy of ECW, we know that. But I feel like you could have booked a competitive match with him. He's already an established character. He's been there for a while. He's not in the title hunt. Why not put him in a competitive one-on-one match versus just a, a random squash with Mikey? Well, I have to, I have to just walk my my words back here, so uh, a bit here. So I did say squash in the beginning, and what I mean by that is, like, I really would have booked it like the way they book Brock Lesnar matches today. And Brock Lesnar matches today, depending on who the opponent is, aren't necessarily squashes. We've seen matches with AJ Styles or even with Finn Balor. They aren't squashes. They're competitive to an extent, and you get the cha- you know you get the big monster in some sort of peril. There's a glimmer of hope. There's a hope spot always to, you know, they're going to go over. And then eventually you have the big monster go over. And that's kind of the feel I wanted with this match. You know, and that's, I think, what the sweet spot was with Mikey Whipwreck. You get that, you know, that glimmer of hope, that hope spot that, you know, he might prevail. He might actually pull this one out. And then he gets eventually, you know, Oklahoma stampeded, you know, seemingly through the mat. Uh, I think would have been a really fun way and 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 a great way to utilize Mikey Whipwreck. He, he, he compared it to a Brock Lesnar match, and I'm trying to think of, like, you use Finn Balor as an example. You can't put Finn Balor and Mikey Whipwreck in the same level because they just straight up aren't. I'm picturing if you're Brock Lesnar in this era, it would be like when Brock faced off against Ricochet at one of the Saudi Arabia shows, and he just demolished him in 10 seconds. Like, I, I don't see a competitive match between Steve Williams and Mikey Whipwreck going by that Brock Lesnar philosophy is what I'm trying to say. Right. Well, I, I think that, I think that there's different versions of the match of different versions of a Brock match. I think a lot of people have it in their minds that Brock matches are typically just very, very quick squash matches. And I don't think that that's the case at all. I think that there is evidence of that, but I definitely think that there are moments where Brock does sell for certain guys and does, um, that's one thing that people sleep on with Brock is that he's an incredible seller. He sells. So I'm well. not trying. I'm not trying to say at all that Brock doesn't sell for people. I'm trying to say that the equivalent of what Mikey Whipwreck would be nowadays, you would not get Brock Lesnar selling for. He would just go in there and tear him apart like the Beast Incarnate does. I'm well aware that if you put a Brock Lesnar against Seth Rollins, they've had competitive matches. John Cena. Samoa Joe, but none of those would be the equivalent of a Mikey Whipwreck. Is do, do you get what I'm trying to say? No, I appreciate what you're saying, but I, I guess I just in terms of the ECW roster in '97, I don't look at, I don't equate like what Mikey Whipwreck to say where like a Ricochet was on the roster when he faced um, Brock Lesnar in Saudi. Like I feel like he's maybe like in an ECW 1997 roster. He's a little bit higher on the card than that, so. I don't know. I could be wrong, but I, I do feel like you get a little bit of competitiveness. And, you know, what's the point of it if you're not going to have that hope spot as we as we discussed? So, you know, I just feel like we would get some fun, fun. Um, we get some fun spots out of this match. And and again, you know, Whipwreck was so great at selling himself and, and he was always sort of he had that compelling nature to him where you really felt for him as a performer when he was getting eviscerated by his opponent. So. I, I feel good about about this booking. I, I think it's I think it's a fun way to to sort of build Doctor Death and still get Mikey Whipwreck, who, as you, to your point, an ECW staple on the card. All right. I mean, it's your rebooking. I don't hate it. I don't love it. I, it is just there. Uh, I assume next up we have Taz and Sabu. Then, or are we doing something we do else indeed. weird? We do indeed. Yeah. Well. Are you going to completely bastardize this one like you have some of the other cards since you just don't like ECW and this is what ECW faithfuls love is this kind of match? Or are you going to let it be? Um, I'm going to let it be to a certain extent. I'm actually going to change it up a little bit. 
Um, what I'm going to do with this one is I'm going to do a best two out of three submissions match with these two guys. Uh, I know this is a grudge match, so I have Sabu getting the first submission with an Indian deathlock with Taz's calf wedged inside of a steel chair. The second uh, submission is going to come after a series of T-bone suplexes. The Taz mission is applied for the tap by Sabu. And as Sabu has his final flurry of offense, he hits a very snug Northern Lights suplex. Sabu begins to struggle, and it's revealed that Taz has applied a modified dragon sleeper on the mat and chokes out Sabu for the win. Okay. I I don't mind this at all. I like I like a good two out of three falls match. And the fact that it's all submissions, I enjoy that. It's something we don't see very often anymore. I find a two out of three falls match is great. I love it when it goes two and oh because it just completes completely catches people off guard. Uh, but this this works for me. I enjoy this a lot. I like that Taz still wins. I'm I'm good with all of this. Yeah, I was kind of thinking, like, I thought it, I was thinking with the spots in my mind, and I thought that, like, what a cool, like, a bit, originally I was thinking, well, we'll have Taz go over with the Taz mission, but then I would thought, you know what, it would be so unexpected if you won with something else, and I love that visual in my mind of Sabu hitting that Northern Lights, and then Taz locking in that choke and turning it into, like, a modified Dragon Sleeper, I think it'd be such a cool finish. Yeah, no arguments for me. Like, I I think Taz is another one of those cases that I think we spoke about this two weeks ago on the Mania 2001. He came in so strong and had so much, like, fanfare and everybody knew who he was, especially debuting in Madison Square Garden and the history of ECW in New York. And then three months later, he was barely a mid-card guy. Like, he's just another one of those ones that Paul E. was able to show all of his strengths and hide his weaknesses. When you go to the big show in New York, though, they don't always know how to do that. So I, I'll never wrap my head around how you can have such great talent in the ECW company, but when they go somewhere else, it's like, what what the hell happened here? It's a complete 180. Well, I think it's indicative of what we've heard, talked about for years and years with Vince is that you get people getting a big push and then, you know, three weeks or, or a month or six weeks afterwards, you know, he just, he just falls out of favor with them. He's not enamored with them for any particular reason and just decides to, 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 you know, fall them off. Like, I think of, like, Taz's debut in WWE, WWF at the time at Royal Rumble 2000, as, like, maybe one of the best introductions of a character ever. I mean, if you think about him coming in, Everybody had like that whisper, that thinking that maybe he's coming in, maybe he's going to be the next guy, maybe he's going to be the one to face Angle and this and that. And then when he shows up, the, the roof, you know, figuratively blew off Madison Square Garden. Uh, it's not actually dissimilar from the Scott Steiner debut. I mean, they were similar in that sense. Obviously, you know, different fan bases. I think that in 2000, um, wrestling the year 2000 and wrestling i think that probably there were a lot more ecw fans in msg than there were like wcw fans in 2002 in in the garden so i feel as though the the taz debut was more impactful in that sense it was more of a passionate visceral response by the audience than than skateiners was even though it was a big pop but my point is, is that when you have a big debut like that and going up against the undefeated Kurt Angle, who was on fire at that point, and then to fall off and be a part of the, uh, the, the, the well, was, you know, hardcore gimmick battle royal, for the lack of a better term, at WrestleMania 2000, I mean, went from, like, from the, the very top of highs to, you know, a comedy act in very short time. Yeah, it's it's remarkable how far he fell out of grace there. I I can't wrap my head around it, but pretty much anybody that went from ECW to the WWE, with the exception of Rob Van Dam, is the only one that I can really think of, never really made it to the top level. Rhino came close. Lance Storm held the IC title for a minute and then was a tag team guy. But for the most part, none of the ECW originals, as they're called, ever really had a good run in the WWE. But that's kind of Vince. He, he likes to build his own stars, as he says, and not take them from other places and put them to the top. If he signs you and you're from somewhere else, you're probably going to make it to mid-card at best. Yeah, that, that, uh, that ringmaster guy never made it to anywhere. 
Okay, there's always exceptions to the rules, but it could have been we like it's well documented. He could have been Chili McFreeze or Fang, whatever, or McFrost. Mr. Freeze. Like he, yeah, he did not have a lot of good things, and he's openly given all the credit to his ex-wife about his tea getting stone cold. So, yeah. yes, there are exceptions to the rules, but when they're able to do it themselves, really. It's an exception that proves the rule, actually, I think is what it is. Fair enough. Fair enough. Our ne- oh, well, our, our next match, are we ready to go to that? Are, you, are we sure. good with Taz and Sabu? I am, uh, yeah. We have Terry Funk. Terry Funk, the Sandman, and Big Stevie Cool with the Blue Meanie and Hollywood Nova, as well as a couple other dudes who I really don't know who the hell they were, in a three-way dance to determine the number one contendership for the ECW championship that you would face immediately after. Which, I I love this, the fact that they're doing that. I don't always understand why ECW called it a three-way dance instead of a triple threat. I guess just to stand out differently, but I, I know I'm not going to lie, Jay. This is something I would change. I just I'm very curious to see what you do with this one. Um, yeah, this actually doesn't exist. I took it off the card. Gone. Like the the whole thing. Yep, the whole thing's gone. He- so, do we have a number one contendership match, or do we just go into the title match? Do you have something replacing it, or is we're that we're going it? in? We're we're going into the main event. Uh, okay. Main events, the main event is actually going to be a triple threat ladder match for the ECW Championship. It's going to be Raven versus Terry Funk versus Sandman. Okay, so here's before you get into it, I just kind of quickly want to say what I would have changed. I wouldn't have had Terry Funk in the main event. Because you're trying to showcase your talent, your homegrown talent to a degree. Terry Funk is the legend. But just going off of what you just rebooked, if you're going to have Shane Douglas do an open challenge, why not put Terry Funk in there and not have him in the main event? Do you know what I mean? Like, I feel like that was a better spot for him. But I'm definitely open to hear what you have here. No, no, I, I, I appreciate what you're saying. And um, again, I, I, I think that my my approach to this, to this booking is more along the lines of this is your first pay-per-view, pull out all the big guns, all the, all the big stops, um, you know, try to showcase, make as, make yourself look as big a presentation as possible. I understand it's a niche audience in ECW. You're not going to get a ton of people that aren't ECW fans ordering the pay-per-view. Of course you get the curiosity factor, but I do definitely feel as though, this you know that you needed some star power not to say that ecw didn't have stars but you needed some established more mainstream wrestling stars on this card so here's how i booked this i i'm not sure where you're going to land with this you're going to love it or you're going to hate it but you'll appreciate the detail i think nonetheless so i have a bloodbath ecw style it's plunder galore with table spots unprotected chair shots to the head Sandman takes a flaming kendo stick shot to the head and to then the stomach from Funk. Raven then hits Funk with a vicious low blow and drives him into the flaming kendo stick for the using the even flow DDT. Raven climbs the ladder and is poised to retain when Tommy Dreamer, who is on commentary, runs in and knocks him off the ladder. Dreamer is unloading on Raven with hard right hands and busts, o- busts Raven open. Both Sandman and Funk are both still lifeless. Tommy Dreamer starts to tease lighting Raven's hair on fire with the reignited kendo stick. With Dreamer's back to the hard cam playing to the crowd, we see someone enter the ring, presumably a fan who's being held back by security. But as we get a look, uh, a clear look at his face, it's Jake the Snake Roberts. After Roberts slithers out of the clutches of security, spins around an oblivious Dreamer and nails him with a DDT. Sandman is coming to and he charges Roberts who backdrops him over the top rope through a table to, uh, that was set up earlier on. He then picks up Funk with a bloody um, who is bloody and barely conscious and tells him Funk you bitch and hits him with a stiff DDT. Jake then helps Raven to his feet and positions the ladder. Raven climbs to the top and retrieves the championship. We go off the air with Jake the Snake Roberts holding Raven's hand up in the air with both Dreamer and Funk bloody and on bloody heaps on the canvas. Raven is, or sorry, Sandman is on the floor and buried under a pile of rubble. And from here, 
we get this amazing alliance of two of the most sinister minds in wrestling, one from the 80s, one from the 90s, the alliance of Jake the Snake and Raven. Okay. So there are aspects of this that I absolutely love, and there are aspects of this that I'm not the biggest fan of. I love Raven. I love that Raven one. You know I'm a big Raven fan. That makes me happy. My yep. only issue, like, and the, 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 the fact that Jake is in this and he's paired up with Raven, like, I literally got goosebumps just thinking about what kind of a weird Raven's flock slash snake pit faction that that could turn into. It would be incredible. I don't like the fact that it's Jake in 97, though. Because you're saying, oh, he's slithering away and this and that. Jake in 97 was 300, 300 pounds. He was not in shape. There's no way that he's inconspicuously getting into the ring. Like, you know what I mean? That's the issue that I'm taking with this right now. Okay, well, The to your match point- itself, I think you have laid out perfectly. I love how it, uh, how it is. I love that you made it a bloodbath, for lack of a better term, because their first pay-per-view, their main event... Pull, all, pull out all the shots, like you said, go for it. I just, yeah, I just don't buy Jake being a mystery person who's getting in the ring easily and able to do anything physical, really, at this point. Well, that's exactly sort of the reasoning why I had him being, you know, held back by security and things of that nature, why I was specifically saying that Dreamer's back was to the hard camera. So in case there was some kind of like a time discrepancy, if Jake was going to have a hard time getting in the ring with that, you know, you're going to have the, you can, you can sort of camouflage that with the security holding him back. Uh, Jake could still move relatively well at this time. He was still working in the fed less than six months from this. Uh, he, he didn't look horrible. He didn't look, you know, at his peak, but he could still move to somewhat of a degree. Um, so I felt like, um, you're not going to get, uh, a Jake Raven, um, you know, ultimate tag team that runs roughshod over ECW. My thinking going forward with this is that you have the teacher in Jake, you know, spoon feeding more information of how to be more sinister into Raven's ear and teaching Raven how to be, um, you know, the ultimate conniving, disgusting, destructive human being. Um, we had yet to see Tommy Dreamer have a win over Raven uh, in a one-on-one match. So I feel like you're going to build towards that. You're going to have a stop along the way. Raven left in G- uh, June of 97 to go to WCW. So I feel like maybe in May you do the tag match. You do uh, Dreamer and, and Funk versus Roberts and Raven. And then you finally blow off the feud before Raven leaves with the, the, uh, the Tommy Dreamer and Raven match in June of 1997. I definitely feel like this was a great way to sort of enhance the character. Again, bringing in stars, established stars from the past. And then on top of that, you have to remember that Jake was in ECW 97. It was the summer of 97, but it was, it did happen. Um, and it was against, you know, giving a DDT to Jerry Lawler. So I feel like I would much rather see this. And again, your point to like the presentation of having J- uh, Jake and Raven together, it just fits. And then eventually, you know, before, before Raven leaves, you can blow off that feud. You know, this is mid, mid-April. So you have about, you know, about two months. So right towards the end of Raven's run, when he's just about to drop the title to Dreamer, you can have you can have um, Raven get some ultra heat going out of the company and dropping the title by having him just beat the beat Jake to shreds right before on television before you do the match. So I think it all fits really well, and I think it adds a ton of fuel to the fire for you know going forward in the promotion. I mean, hearing you lay it out like that, it's kind of hard to argue with it. The only thing I'm not the biggest fan of about the the Jake and Raven pairing is. I find when you put a legend with a younger talent, you're almost saying you don't have faith in the younger talent on the microphone or something along those lines. Like, you know what I mean? That's, that's always how it's been. You put a mouthpiece with them because they can't talk. Raven could talk, and I don't want Jake to 
old shine Raven. Like I still want Raven to be able to do his promos and everything like that. You know? Do you know? Do you know where I'm coming from there, though? Hundred percent. I hundred percent agree with that. And I I don't think that that Jake would be a mouthpiece for Raven whatsoever. I think that maybe what you'd have is you'd have a situation where you'd have uh, Jake maybe come out and cut a promo. You know, nobody cut a promo better than Jake in the business. Have him come out and cut a promo to set Raven up for his promo. And I can also see some really interesting, like, excuse me, ECW-esque backstage vignettes where you kind of see like that, you know, it was so, so um, famous in the late 90s of seeing like guys have conversations and, you know, being oblivious to the camera. Just imagine seeing Jake, especially in that more, you know, R-rated environment, teaching Raven some of the most, you know, sinister um, ideas and tactics of how to get over, teaching him how to be ruthless and disgusting and have no regard for anybody but himself. And ultimately, you tell that story through the vignettes and through the storylines and through the weeks leading up, you tell that story of finally Raven learning from the master and then ultimately just completely um, demolishing the master, you know, t- taking what he's been taught by Jake and turning it around on him. And then that will light that incredible heat that you need going into that final blow off with Dreamer, who, who so richly deserved that final win. And with, with Raven leaving the company, Oh my God! It's just going to enhance the, enhance the gimmick and enhance the storyline so much in my mind. No, I I get it. I mean, I was I forget that ninety seven, like I forget the era of this. Like Jake was in the Fed only a few months prior. I had it in my mind that we were almost at Heroes of Wrestling, Jake. But I just looked that up, and that wasn't until ninety nine. Yeah, he so was in the Rumble. The he was in the Royal Rumble in ninety seven. Yeah, and he wasn't looking great, but he wasn't looking bad. You're absolutely right. So I take back what I said. Uh, yeah, I would I would actually pay money in, nowadays if I could find a tape somehow of Raven and Jake against Dreamer and Funk. That would be fantastic. But we all know it didn't happen. Uh, yeah. yeah, okay. For your, your first ECW rebooking, Jay, I got to say, you, uh, you didn't piss me off as much as I thought you would. You did. You did all right. I'll give you a solid thumbs in the middle on this one. Yeah, I wasn't sure. I I was concerned that maybe you'd think, oh, he's just trying to insert Fed guys in there. But, you know, the thing for me was that because all these guys were there already or going to be there within a couple of months, I figured, you know, there's really no difference. And, uh, you know, I just, I definitely, I think, like, to your point, the, the Jake and, and Raven stuff would just be magic, especially those backstage vignettes with Paul Heyman producing and with Jake's mic skills and Raven's mic skills as well. I, I just think it would be, if it had happened, I think it'd be something that people would still be talking about today. And for, you know, people who are up and coming in the wrestling business today, or even 10 years later or what have you, um, that would be like a, like a promo class, watching those two guys work and cut promos together in the ring, Jake teeing it up, and and Raven, you know, knocking it out of the park, and then you know you move on to that blow off with Dreamer. I think it would have been really cool. Oh, well, there you have it, guys. That is Jay's interpretation of Barely Legal, nineteen ninety seven, and we all know how I feel about it. But let us know how you feel about it. Drop us a comment in the comment section here. Drop us a line on social media. Where whatever you. Your fancy is if if you want snail mail, DM us. We'll give you an address to send it to. But Jay, I think it's time to uh, to let the people know what the hell am I doing next week? Well, my friend, I think uh, to your point at the beginning of the podcast, uh, we we have been very Fed heavy lately. We are going to return to the World Wrestling Federation in short order, but not quite yet. So next week. I want you to rebook something that's actually kind of fun. It's a really solid undercard. A a kind of like a a lost a lost gem, if you will, in the era of WCW. We're going to have you rebook Slamboree 1998. Now, this card was really solid. I just rewatched it last night. Um, I know we're not a big fan of the Benoit matches, or I, I have an easier time watching them than you do, but 
I mean, you had Benoit versus Fit Finley on this card. That was a hell of a match. Um, also interesting that uh, on the canon version of this card, Hulk Hogan, who was the champion, was omitted. He wasn't on this card. Maybe he wasn't one of his contractual dates for pay-per-views for the year. I don't know. I am rather certain that Tyrone will rectify that, but I could be wrong. Um, nonetheless, it is the height of the WCW NWO storyline. Uh, the most successful year in the history of that company. So you have a lot of star power to play with and a lot of different fun ways to go with this particular one. I just looked this one up. This is this is the one where Bischoff was trying to call out McMahon and get him in the ring, wasn't it? Yep, exactly. Well, I could have a lot of fun with that one, man. Oh, my God. <laughs> yes, You're going to have Vince yes, show up, aren't you? I I can't give you any spoilers on that one yet, can I? But I can promise you one thing, and that is you will not see Hulk Hogan on this pay-per-view. Okay. As long as Brett stays, I'm happy. Uh, well, I guess I guess you guys will all have to tune in next week when uh, when Jay finds out what I do with this fun little ditty that he gave me. Yeah, it is a ditty indeed. And we are very much looking forward to uh, the months, uh, weeks and months uh, ahead. Uh, and thank you so much to all of you for listening to our podcasts as of late. WrestleMania week, we know, is a very convoluted time for every wrestling fan. There's just so much content being thrown at you. But we're very grateful that you've gone back and listened to some of our uh, events and rebookings. I noticed recently that uh, WrestleMania X8 that we rebooked has started to uh, get a couple of extra views. Uh, as well as WrestleMania 7. So we thank you very much for that. And we hope that going forward into the spring, you're going to enjoy some really fun content. We have some anniversary shows coming up and things of that nature. So with that being said, for ECW Barely Legal 1997, for myself, for, fight, for Tyrone, for Jake the Snake Roberts, for Raven, for Mikey Whipwreck, and for Vince versus Bischoff, you've been listening to... The Good Friends, Better Enemies Podcast. Good underscore enemies Twitter. Good double underscore enemies Instagram. And Good Friends, Better Enemies Podcast Facebook. Bye.